It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Speaker. Today is Equal Pay Day in Ontario. It symbolizes how far into the next year the average woman has to work to earn what the average man has earned in the previous year. And we haven't yet reached the equal pay day if you're a woman who's racialized, indigenous, 2SLGBTQIA+, or disabled. Speaker, pay equity is the law in this province. So my question to the Premier is, will he commit to enforcing the law to ensure every woman worker earns as much as her male counterparts? Bishop, Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Mr. Speaker, our government is dedicated to supporting equal pay for work of equal value, and our government introduced the Supporting Retention in Public Service Act to ensure that existing pay gaps are not widened and that we are ensuring that employers meet their obligations when it comes to equal pay for equal work. And I'd also like to say that we have the Pay Equity Office in place to ensure that we have a functioning and strong complaint system in place. And they are busy and they are working really hard. But Mr. Speaker, we've also been working diligently on empowering women and providing women with supports to make sure they have all the resources they need to enter, enter or re-enter the workforce. And we're breaking down barriers for women so that they feel free to pursue male-dominated jobs, such as ones in the skills Response. and STEM. And Mr. Speaker, we are taking many actions and making sure that we're going into communities and making sure organizations have the supports to see women succeed in Ontario. A supplementary question. Speaker, this government is actually in the courts right now fighting to suppress the wages of largely female workforce. of living is going up and up and up, and many women are having trouble covering even basic necessities. And while this government does next to nothing to tackle the affordability crisis, I'm sorry to say, Speaker, that their for-profit health scheme is only going to make it worse. It's going to cost women more in health care user fees and upselling, and women health care workers are going to earn even less, too, because research shows that privatizing public services leads to lower wages for women. Back to the Premier, will he stop his privatization agenda to deliver fairness for women? The Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While women's workforce participation has increased significantly, we do know that there are gender pay gaps. And in fact, you know, when we close the gender pay gaps and increase women's participation in the labour force and increase women's representation in high productive economic sectors like um, agriculture, like health care, you name it, we could be adding up to $60 billion to Ontario's economy by 2026. And Mr. Speaker, we're seeing a significant increase in women entering in the workforce. Around 70,000 women have come back to the workforce since December, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to continue to keep moving forward because we know women have so much to contribute to Ontario. And I'm telling Mr. Speaker, when women have to take care of their families, they need to make sure they can afford things. And the gas tax is making it very difficult for women to be able to afford the basics in life. So, Mr. Speaker, I would encourage the members opposite to support. Stop the clock for a second, please. I can't hear what's being said with my earpiece. Uh, there seems to be a technical malfunction. So, no heckling. There can't be any heckling until we get this fixed. Because I can't hear. Okay. Start the clock. The final supplementary. Uh, 68 cents on the dollar. 68 cents on the dollar. That's what women are earning right now. And uh, it's not right. It's just not right. Closing the gender wage gap lifts up all workers. Closing the gender wage gap makes our province more attractive to international investment. Closing the gender wage gap is the right thing to do for our economy and for women. To the Premier, will he commit to closing the gender wage gap once and for all? Please take your seats. The Associate Minister.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the member opposite and the leader of the opposition is absolutely right. And that's why we have a government that sees women's social and economic opportunities as a priority. Women contribute so much to our overall economy, and that's why we are investing significantly to see that we are expanding the Investing in Women's Futures program across Ontario, which we announced 10 more locations opening up to get more women the skills and the supports they need to get into the workforce and into the driver's seat of their financial future. Mr. Speaker, we've invested over $117 million in employment and tr uh, training support so that women have training for in-demand skills and have the opportunities to connect with the employers. That's why we have the Minister of Economic Development, who's brought in billions of dollars in the EV um, technology Spons? sector, that is going to see women in many of those positions, Mr. Right. Speaker. Yeah. Ontario is primed and ready to see women at the forefront, and we are doing everything. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, two SLGBTQIA communities across Ontario are more and more seeing hate-filled protests, especially at community events like drag performances. But Ontario doesn't have a plan to get tough on anti-queer or anti-trans hate crimes or to keep drag artists safe. Speaker, my question is again to the Premier. Does his government agree that queer and trans Ontarians deserve new protections from hate crimes and legally enforceable safe spaces? Citizenship and multiculturalism. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Leader of the Opposition for that very important question. Uh, first and foremost, Ontario is proud to be home to a strong, resilient and vibrant 2SLGBTQ plus communities whose experiences and contributions have shaped our province into the great place it is today. There is no place for hate of any kind here in Ontario, and it will never be tolerated. As a Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism, I am proud to be working with the 2SLGBTQ community, listening and learning from their lived experiences and the ongoing struggles that we work on together for equity and inclusion. We will continue to work with our LGP2 plus community as allies and partners to build a stronger, safer, and more inclusive Ontario. Response. Together, we will continue to build a province where people from all walks of life can freely express who they are and who they love wherever they want. Here, here. Thank you. Supplementary question. Well, uh, Speaker, sadly, it is being tolerated. And a few months ago, I was in Hamilton uh, when a fabulous drag artist, Crystal Quartz, uh, who's coming here into the gallery in a few minutes, was putting on a show uh, at Kelsey's. And unfortunately, there was a really hateful protest outside the restaurant. So MPP Wong Tam and I decided to go and show our support. This is in Hamilton, but we're seeing this all across the province. Guelph, Sault Ste. Marie, North Bay, Welland, Renfrew, Alora, Dryden, Sarnia, Peterborough, Ottawa, Toronto. Speaker, just a few of the cities in Ontario where drag artists have faced hate speech, harassment, and even death threats. Communities have come together to resist this hate in many inspiring ways, but without the urgent action that people need, people are at risk. Back to the Premier. Will his government commit today to supporting the NDP's legislation to protect 2SLGBTQIA plus communities and drag artists across Ontario? Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Uh, thank you, and, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again for the question. Uh, Speaker, as I mentioned, hate and intolerance against anyone in any form will never be tolerated by this government or in this great province. <laughs> Ontario, Ontario is a place where people from all traditions, customs, and beliefs can come and, f and express fully and safely respected no matter your background, faith, or sexual orientation. Um, I'd like to uh, just remind the NDP that, uh, or the opposition, that it is under the leadership um, of this Premier and this government that we invested $40 million to protect faith, cultural, and vulnerable communities. An additional, another $5 million to raise awareness to fight hate and racism in all its forms. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this government will always stand with our 2SLGBTQ community and all vulnerable communities to make sure they can live in the province of Ontario free of hate and can succeed. And the final supplementary. 
Um, well, Speaker, uh, with thanks to the minister, I mean, the words are nice, but, but we need urgent action. And my question was very specific. Queer and trans Ontarians have been asking for action from this government for months. Every time an all-ages drag event is targeted in a small business or a library, it's not just 2SLGBTQIA plus Ontarians, but also staff and workers and business owners who are threatened. So again, to the Premier, will his government step up and stop the hateful extremists from trying to force queer and trans people back in the closet? Respond, the government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I, uh, I thank the, the member for the question. It's obviously a, a very uh, important question, but let me just say to the, the leader of the opposition: uh, Look, we are uh, supporting all Ontarians, uh, uh, regardless of, uh, of uh, sexual orientation, uh, uh, race, uh, creed, Mr. Speaker. Nobody wants to force anybody back into the closet. So I, I reject that. Uh, I reject that outright, uh, uh, Speaker. But I do understand. Uh, the, the issues that the Leader of the Opposition is raising, and I, and I fully expect that she's raising them in, uh, uh, with uh, the utmost uh, uh, care and, uh, and, and wants to promote uh, an, important, uh, uh, an important issue in the community. That's why the government is con continuing, I know the Solicitor General, uh, the Minister of Multiculturalism, uh, uh, and the Minister of Education with respect to some of the changes that we're making in our Response. education. Uh, uh, in, uh, in our school system, Mr. Speaker. We are all seized on this, and it's not just the government, frankly. I think members on all sides of the House understand how it, important it is that everybody feels safe in the province of Ontario and that we honour everybody's right to, to live and prosper in Ontario, regardless of who you are, who you love, uh, and what God you, uh, you worship. Thank you. Next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Some of the drag artists that uh, the leader was speaking about are specifically in the House today. Scarlett Bobo, Crystal Quartz, and a number of other drag performers prominent across Ontario and Canada are here. <laughs> Speaker, Speaker, they have been asking and calling for action from this government now for months. They are asking for help, their shows are being targeted, their audience is being discriminated against, as well as harassment being targeted at the, at the venues, the business that are hosting these events. Because there has been no action and no real response from the government, we're putting together a, table, a, a private member's bill that will specifically address the hatred targeting the 2S LGBTQI community in Ontario. I need to know, and we all need to know today, will you be working with us to make sure that this bill becomes law to protect that community, protect this community? Again, the government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Look, as I say on every piece of, uh, of private members' business, the House, uh, the House will, uh, will review the legislation uh, it, once it's tabled and, and will make a decision. Members will make a decision on their own whether that should be supported. We have demonstrated, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, over the last uh, five years in two, uh, two parliaments that a good piece of legislation that is uh, broadly supported by members on all sides of the House will receive the support from members on all sides uh, of the House. There is, of course, already a significant body of legislation that is in place to protect uh, uh, all communities, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and, uh, and we, of course, uh, have put significant additional resources in place, not only the Minister of Multiculturalism, uh, but as well as uh, the Solicitor General, to ensure that all communities uh, are safe, uh, Speaker, but specific to the bill. Once the member has tabled the bill, we will give it due consideration as Response. we do every private member's bill, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. We're not talking about all communities. Today, we're talking about this community, the drag community, the 2S LGBT plus community. Across Ontario, from Toronto to Thunder Bay, communities have been targeted. They are experiencing hate and violence on the very doorsteps of your business associations and on your uh, small business storefronts. From Welland to Fort Erie to Guelph to Kingston, Kitchener, Gravenhurst, Brockville, Peel, Elora, Lambton, Sarnia, Sudbury, Sault Ste. Marie, North Bay, and I could go on. The list is so long. The private member's bill will take years, and this government will know it. It will take years for it to pass. Will you expedite that process? Will you work with us to protect the community today? Today, Speaker. Thank you. 
Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I do expect that the Human Rights Commission will ensure that uh, communities are safe. But we were just in this House yesterday speaking about uh, uh, some of the failings in the criminal justice system across, the, across this country, Mr. Speaker, and I think that we would all agree that our criminal justice system has to do a better job of ensuring that all people are safe. Now, we saw just yesterday this very same member try to water down, water down a motion that would have done just that, Mr. Speaker. So I say very clearly to the member opposite, we are going to do everything everything in our power, continue to do everything in our power to make sure the people of the province of Ontario are safe. We're going to continue to work with the Minister of Multiculturalism, the Minister of the Solicitor General, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, Minister of Order. Education, but at the same time, they could, you could also help Order. by ensuring that when we bring forward legislation or that we encourage the federal government to bring forward legislation Response. that protects not only this very important community, but all of the people of this country, Mr. Speaker, and stop watering it down. Don't say one thing here and do another thing when it comes time to vote to keep our community safe. Stop the clock. Order. The next question. Start the clock. The member from Markham Unionville. Morning, Speaker. My question is to the Associate Minister of Transportation. People of my riding in Markham Unionville relied on our transit networks to ensure they are connected to Toronto and the GTA. While they may not live in Toronto's downtown core, many individuals and families still wish to access major sites and attractions through a convenient and affordable transit system. As families continue to experience the impact of global economic challenges and rising costs, they remain mindful of how best to manage their expenses. That's why our government must create opportunities to make everyday life more affordable for individuals and families. Speaker, can the Associate Minister of Transportation please share with the House that our government is doing to make more convenient to make transit and visit the latest attractions. Recognize the minister. Thank you, Speaker. A great question coming out of Markham Union Bill this morning with a great member who works tirelessly for his constituents. Thank you. Uh, Speaker, I am happy to tell that member that we are delivering for hardworking Ontarians and making it more affordable when they want to go out and have a little fun with their families. Speaker, Presto Perks is what I'm talking about, leaving more cash in people's pockets thanks to our work. You know that kids already ride free on go, and Presto card holders can save up to 20% on admission uh, to the Hockey Hall of Fame, where you can see the new cup with the Leafs engraved in it after this year, uh, the Ontario Science Centre, uh, the Royal Ontario Museum, and also next week's Princess Auto Players Curling Championship at the Madame Centre. What's more, Speaker, through Presto, TFC fans can commute to BMO Fields and save 20% off their ticket prices while they cheer on the boys in red throughout the 2023 season. Speaker, with Preston Perks, we're putting more money back into families' pockets. That includes when they want to have some fun. Supplementary question, the member from Arkham Union. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister of his response. Great response. It is good news for individuals and families who will benefit just that much more than the extra savings. However, making lives affordable needs to look beyond initiatives that can help people save money at events and attractions. Our government needs to focus as well on broader issues, including the affordability of transit. Unlike the previous Liberal government, where affordable public transit was not a priority, our government is paying attention to the needs of Go Transit riders. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please elaborate on how our government is delivering greater transit affordability? Again, the Associate Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you, Speaker. The member is bang on. Affordability is an issue, and that comes to transit as well. And that's why Metrolinx has not raised their fare prices in four years, and we continue to make fares more affordable. Riders continue to benefit, especially from the stellar Go affordability pilot we introduced last year, which gives a 50% reimbursement to applicable riders in Peel Region. We're also delivering for hardworking students. We nearly doubled the post-secondary student discount and youth discount for those aged 13 to 19 to 40 percent off fares off of Go and Up Express. That's not all, Speaker. We eliminated the double fares across the GTHA when you're connecting from your local transit agency to the Go network. And as announced in the budget just a few short weeks ago, 
That's going to include the TTC by the end of the year, Speaker. Really good news. Imagine you can go from Barrie, take Barrie Transit Response. to Union Station, connect to the TTC, all the way to visit your friend in Liberty Village for just the price of a go fare. We're making it more affordable to take. Next question. The member for Toronto St. Paul. Thank you, Speaker. According to Ontario Equal Pay Coalition, my question to, is to the Premier. Equal Pay Day today symbolizes how far into the next year most women must work in order to have earned what most men had earned in the previous year. In other words, women are disproportionately working for free and are not being paid equal pay for equal work. And it's even worse, Speaker, for BIPOC, 2SLGBTQIA+, and women with disabilities, as well as immigrant women. This Conservative government widened the gender wage gap with their Bill 124 attack against women and other public sector workers. My question is to the Premier. Will the Premier help close the gender wage gap by repealing Bill 124, stopping its appeal, and while you're at it, activate pay transparency today? The Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, our government is fighting very hard to empower women and to close the gender pay gap by addressing the barriers that make it difficult for women to enter or re-enter and stay in the workforce, addressing things like participation that impacts pay equity. Mr. Speaker, we are seeing more and more women, and I'm going across Ontario and I'm blown away by the amount of women who are leaders in their sectors, <laughs> leaders and CEOs, women who are on the C-suite, who are, and the goal is to get more women in leadership because these women are high hiring more women because they see the benefits yeah. and the value of having women and the workforce. Mr. Speaker, we're investing significantly to get more women into the skilled trades, a sector that pays well, has great benefits, and can provide significant impo economic empowerment for women for Response. generations. Mr. Speaker, we take this seriously because we know women play a valuable and an important role in growing Ontario's economy. Great. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the supplementary question. For these women leaders that the Conservative government talks about, they need to get paid. Yes. So bring in pay transparency. My question is back to the Premier. Courts ruled Conservative government anti-worker Bill 124 illegal and unconstitutional. Yet this Premier still appealed, wasting taxpayers' money, working women's money, health care heroes' money, during an affordability crisis to bankroll his political power trip. Workers didn't go silently into the night. Women clapped back and stood up against legislated bullying. This weekend, women won. Nurses won a reopener on Bill 24, which awarded hospital nurses, predominantly women, back pay to recover some, Speaker, some of what they've lost. This is a step forward towards closing the gender wage gap. My question is back to the Premier. Will the Premier question. listen to the courts this time? Commit to paying hospital nurses back pay owed? Yes or no? Thank you, Speaker. The Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And you know, all women in all sectors are valued, and we appreciate and thank everything that they are doing. Order. Our economy and move Ontario forward. Mr. Speaker, we're seeing more and more when women enter the workforce, and isn't that what we want to see? Mm -hmm. Women being in the driver's seat of their economic future and leaders in their field and their sector. Isn't that what we want for all women to see women like the women up there? Um, just powering through and showing that women can be leaders and strong leaders. And that's why our, our Premier and our government decided to say, hey, we need a, a Ministry of Women's Social and here, Economic here. Opportunity. Hey. We take this seriously, Mr. Speaker. We do this. I don't only do this for my daughters, but I do it for all daughters and all women who are coming up in Ontario and all the women in this room, Mr. Speaker. Response? Seeing the benefits and the values of doing that because I fully believe that when women succeed, Ontario yeah. succeeds. Yeah. Order. Stop the clock. Members will please take their seats. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Simcoe Gray. Good morning. My question is for the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. 
Speaker, buying a new home is a major transaction and often a once-in-a-lifetime, but it should not be a worrisome and stressful experience for individuals and families because they are concerned about the quality of the new home they are purchasing. Under the previous Liberal government, regulations were lacking to ensure that the interests and needs of new home buyers were protected. Unfortunately, their failure to implement and enforce professional standards in the building industry put many people at unnecessary risk. Hardworking Ontarians deserve to be treated fairly when making one of the biggest purchases of their lives. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our, our, how our government is strengthening protections for new home buyers? Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the amazing member from Simcoe Gray for his question. Speaker, I agree with the member that buying a new home can be a complicated and stressful experience for families and individuals across our province. That is why this government made a commitment to the people of Ontario that we would never stop working to make their life easier and improve consumer protections across the province. Speaker, just last week I joined Minister Clark and Minister Tangri to announce another big step in our work towards fulfilling our consumer protection commitment. Speaker, we are consulting with consumer groups, home buying sectors, and the public on a cooling off period for new freehold homes to ensure we are creating the very best protection Response. for Ontarians. Speaker, we are also exploring input on it requiring that purchasers of all new homes receive legal advice on their purchase agreements to ensure that no one in our province gets ripped off by bad and Thank you. Supplementary, the member for Simple Grade. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the hardworking minister for that response. I'm very pleased to hear that our government is implementing measures to improve and raise standards for the home building industry in Ontario. The constituents in my riding of Simcoe Gray have expressed concern about the potential cooling off period and that it could lead to more new home uh, project cancellations by builders and vendors. There is a lot that can happen between the time a buyer signs an agreement of purchase and sale and when they get their keys to their new home, as we have seen over the last 24 months. Our government must take action to ensure that the consumer protections are increased and that companies who build and sell homes in Ontario are held accountable to ensure that they are acting responsibly and ethically. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how this in initiative will give new home buyers confidence in the building industry in Ontario? Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member uh, for the supplementary question. Speaker, under the, this Premier, we have been very clear that in this province there is a zero-tolerance approach for those who try to make extra money off the backs of new home buyers. That's why, Speaker, my ministry, alongside my great colleague, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, have added harsher penalties for bad actors in the industry. We have empowered the Home Construction Regulatory Authority, HCRA, and gave them the ability to stand up to unethical builders in the sector. Those attempting to rip off Ontarians now face the prospect of double maximum financial penalties, Speaker, for repeat offenders of the new Home Construction Licensing Act, the risk of permanently losing their builder's license and speaker for the very first time ever, ensuring that instead of profiting, builders who conduct illegal and Response. unethical behavior will face hundreds of thousands of dollars in fine. Speaker, rest assured that this government continues and will continue to have the back of Ontarians, especially when they make one of the biggest purchases of their lives a new Thank you very much. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, women in female-dominated professions like midwifery, nursing and developmental services have been fighting for pay equity for years under both Liberal and Conservative governments. In 2018, midwives won a historic ruling from the, Ontario, from the Human Rights Tribunal that was confirmed last year by the Ontario Court of Appeal. But this government has continued its systemic pay discrimination against midwives by ignoring the order that would see midwives paid fairly for the vital work they do. Speaker, will this government implement the Human Rights Tribunal order, start respecting midwives, and finally pay them what they are worth? 
Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, there is no doubt that the valuable work that Ontario midwives do um, looking after our individuals who are going through what is, uh, frankly, probably one of the most exciting but scary um, in pieces of their, uh, their medical career. You know, uh, I am really proud of the fact that March 31st, we actually inked a deal with the Ontario Midwives of Ontario for a one-year deal that uh, has now been ratified through their association. And it is going to see an expansion of midwifery in the province of Ontario so that more women, more individuals who want to have a midwife part of their birthing experience can have that in community closer to home. It's one of the things we're working on, making sure that people get access to care in their community closer to home. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Speaker, a 1% increase is hardly paying midwives what they are worth. Speaker, when women workers like midwives, nurses, educational assistants, ECEs fight for wages that reflect the true value of their work, this government refuses to enact pay transparency, ignores remedy orders, suppresses their wages, fights them in court, or threatens to take away their rights. But women aren't taking it, Speaker. And I want to give a shout out to the amazing education workers who forced this government to back down on their use of the notwithstanding. Standing clause. Speaker, today on Equal Pay Day, will this government commit to stop attacking women workers and start bringing forward legislation and policies that actually Question. close the gender wage gap instead of widening it? Respond, the Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, for education workers in the province of Ontario, we did sign a deal with QP, which will increase wages by over 4 per cent each and every year over the next four years for them. We think that is a suitable reflection of the good work they do within our schools, overwhelmingly ratified by the union. That will help ECs as well as EAs and other critical workers in our schools. Mr. Speaker, in the child care deal, which our government signed, a critical way by which we can ensure more labour market participation of women in our economy, we signed a deal that is finally going to make child care affordable after an increase by 400% under the former Liberals. This program is cutting fees by 50% this year. It's creating 86,000 spaces. It's going to help ensure we have higher labour market participation, so women do not no longer have to choose between staying at home, raising a child, or going to work. We Bonds. believe in them, we're investing in them, and we're hiring more of them to ensure families get the supports they need in our economy. Speaker. The next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Tobacco is one of the most common illegally traded goods in the world, and Ontario is ground zero with sales of illegal product on par with El Salvador. Illicit tobacco threatens the safety of our communities as profits fuel organized crime involved in drugs, guns, and human trafficking. Legitimate businesses suffer while the government loses out on $750 million in taxes annually. Speaker, this government knows where the problem originates, and provinces like BC are unhappy with Ontario as illegal sales in their province skyrockets, even though they have no producers. I wouldn't be shocked if Ontario sent invoices for policing and health care costs. Quebec's model of dealing with contraband tobacco is extraordinary, and Ontario signaled that model would be adopted in the 2019 budget, but the policy was pulled days before print. Speaker, to the minister, who or what Question. is the reason the policy was pulled in 2019, and why is it missing again in the 2023 budget? And to reply, the parliamentary assistant and member for Oakville. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, <clears throat> thank you to the member opposite. And we do take uh, contraband tobacco uh, very seriously. In fact, un unregulated tobacco undermines Ontario's tax system. It creates business uncertainty and compromises the health and safety of Ontario families, as well as businesses. We've reviewed recommendations from key stakeholders and the Indigenous Facilitators Report on unregulated tobacco. These extensive consultations will inform our approach on addressing tobacco issues in a balanced and sustainable manner. We're also continuing to support existing partnerships with various police services. And going forward, the government knows that the problems of unregulated tobacco causes the people of Ontario concern, and that's why we're taking a comprehensive approach to address this situation. Supplementary question. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. In 2014, the federal government amended the Criminal Code of Canada, Bill C-10, to create a new offence of trafficking in contraband tobacco and to provide for minimum penalties of imprisonment for repeat offenders. I'm happy the minister uh, brought up um, unregulated tobacco because as soon as this government came to power, it actually changed the wording from contraband to unregulated in the Tobacco Tax Act. How do police and prosecutors apply the law under an ambiguous term like unregulated. Contraband tobacco was such a concern to the federal Conservative government 10 years ago that they amended the criminal code, yet this government has made it easier for criminals to work around the law. Tobacco was referred to on page 184 of the recent budget. It's housekeeping, and it'll do little to curb contraband tobacco. Speaker, can the minister explain why each budget under this government contains the word unregulated as opposed to contraband, illicit, or illegal? Parliamentary assistant, member for Oakville. Thank you again to the member opposite. This is something we do take seriously. And uh, in the budget of 2021, uh, the government of Ontario increased funding to the OPB's uh, contraband tobacco enforcement team of $1.5 million. We're also collaborating with federal partners on strengthening border enforcement and addressing tobacco smuggling. And we're enhancing the Ministry of Finance oversight of raw leaf tobacco through the use of more in innovative digital technologies. But what we would also do is call on the federal government to get bail reform. You did mention people getting out and, and causing problems again. We are calling on the federal government. We hope the opposition will support us in calling on the federal government for immediate bail reform. Here, Thank here. You. Next question, the member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Ontario's music industry is vital to our province's culture and economy. I think we all know this. This industry drives innovative creation and helps generate employment opportunities throughout. Individual artists, like my wife and daughter, Speaker, and groups involved in Ontario's music industry hold a special place in advancing the success of great Canadian music here and, in fact, worldwide. For example, London, Ontario has become a hub of Ontario's dynamic music industry where musical talent can perform and thrive. But, Speaker, in order to increase Ontario's profile and prestige on the national and world stage, our government must take the lead in creating more opportunities for emerging artists to record and perform in Ontario. Speaker, can the minister please explain Question. how our government is supporting the development of the music industry in Ontario, especially in communities like Elgin, Middlesex, London? Excellent. Question. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London uh, for all his work that he's doing and for his family's talents, not necessarily that they count to you. Last week, I saw firsthand the City of London's Music Expo and how integral the music scene is, not only for London, but for Ontario. London has been designated UNESCO City of Music, the first Canadian city to be de designated that, and only the fourth in North, Amer North America, a tremendous accomplishment. Each year, our government invests millions of dollars in the industry through the Ontario Music Investment Fund. Ontario's music scene is really booming, Mr. Speaker, and it really has become part of tourism. Uh, and I had the opportunity in my visit to London on Friday to spend some time not only with the mayor, but to sit in a round table with all Response. the members of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I'd like to suggest, uh, to use a music analogy, um, three-part harmony is a little bit of tourism, culture, and sport, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, uh, and thank you to the Minister for hosting a great reception last night celebrating Tennis Canada and our success at the Davis Cup. Well yeah. done. <laughs> Cultural, sporting and tourism events are all critical to the success of local businesses throughout this province. Uh, just recently, London hosted the 2023 Tim Hortons Briar, and it was a massive success, Speaker. This event brought thousands of people to Budweiser Gardens in London's downtown core, including my family and friends, along with the Minister uh, of, of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, along with the Minister of College, Colleges and Universities. It was great to have them there. Local businesses were brimming with patrons, and in fact, there were lineups out the door. London tourism officials said they have received tremendous feedback from local businesses, establishments, as well as Curling Canada. 
Successful events such as the Briar Question. underline the importance of sport to communities across this province. Speaker, can the minister please explain how this government is supporting local communities to expand tourism, cultural, and sporting activities? Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, thank you for the question. Uh, music culture and notice I didn't say tourism culture this time. I said music culture and sport are linked together. I think we all know through sport at all ages, the culture part of music, the culture part of sport, and really the culture part of tourism tied together nicely. And the impact that it has on local communities, as London is finding out, is second to none. I found that out in that, my meeting with the Chamber of Commerce and with the Mayor. Their strategies, their plans, what they're working with, with what they have, is second to none. And they deserve an awful lot of credit, Mr. Speaker. But the other part of the sports side and hosting, we have to remember the impact of sport on our communities. Let's not forget what tourism does and sport does when we move into a community and have let's say a few hockey tournaments of 100 plus teams. Restaurants, res restaurants, hotels are full, but more importantly, we're helping build young leaders through sport, Mr. Speaker. We take that very seriously. Our Premier does, and I do. Our next leader. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Hamilton West and Pastor Dundas. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Ontario is facing a serious understaffing in childcare directly related to the low wages of this women-led sector. The Association of Early Childhood Educators and the YMCA came to pre-budget consultations to tell the government that these workers need and deserve decent wages with benefits and pensions. If this government was truly committed to closing the wage gap, if this government actually valued the work of these early educators, they would compensate them fairly. So, Speaker, my question on equal pay day, will the government commit today to increasing wages for Ontario's child care workers? Minister of Education. Thank you very much. Uh, I can assure the member the answer is yes. We're going to continue to increase wages each and every year in the course of this agreement with the federal government by at least $1 per hour every year, rising to $25. But I accept and I hear clearly from uh, operators, from staff, and of course from members opposite and members of our government that want to see wages to increase so that we retain these critical workers, which are a prerequisite of economic growth. We need a strong, dependable, affordable childcare system in all communities, small large. It's why we're expanding spaces. It's why we've announced a significant reduction in fees for families. And yes, it's why we're, we've actually uh, are, are consulting with the sector to understand what exactly to do further, in addition to the federal deal, to increase wages and lift up those uh, the opportunities within Spons. that sector. We're going to continue to listen, continue to increase wages, and be there for the workers who make a difference for our kids. Speaker, I have to say on Equal Pay Day, workers, women-led workers deserve a much better answer than that from the Minister of Education. Because pay equity is not just about the money that's coming into women's pockets, it's also about the money going out. Right. One of the most significant costs for women in this province is childcare. Ontarians have been promised over and over again $10 a day childcare, but this government is still failing to deliver. Women paying their bills at the end of each month know that nothing has changed, even though you signed this federal deal months and months and months ago. So, will this government finally make the investments, your investments, needed to deliver $10 a day childcare for women, for families, and for children in this province? For education. Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure the members of the NDP could take yes for an answer. I, I have confirmed in absolute terms wages will increase every single year over the course of this year to a minimum, a floor of $25 per hour. Now, I acknowledge that there's more to do, which is why we're working together with the Minister of Social and Economic Opportunities for Women to ensure we greater retain those workers and attract more of them because we're going to need them because we're creating 86,000 more additional spaces as we reduce fees by 50 percent, on average $8,000 to $12,000 per child per year. Mr. Speaker, our consultation will conclude, will produce a plan and provide a sense of hope to these workers who we value and we thank each and every day by increasing their wages and giving them more incentives to stay, to work and make a difference in the lives of young people in Ontario. Great, Next question, member for Orleans. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. There's no, do no doubt that the increase in violent crime the past number of years is disturbing. There are too many stories of those accused of violent crime being let out of jail right away, only to offend again. Women killed by their partner, police officers ambushed, children killed while waiting for the subway, and too many more. And Mr. Speaker, the Standing Committee on Justice Policy made five recommendations to the government for provincial action on bail reform. Other than writing a letter to the Prime Minister, when will this government make progress on the actions recommended by the Justice Policy Committee to strengthen bail reform in Ontario? And to reply, the government house leader. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And he's uh, quite right. Uh, the premier was the one who led the charge across the country to ensure that the federal government took action on bail reform. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, as I said, across the country, whether it was a, 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 an NDP premier in British Columbia or a Liberal premier in, uh, in uh, Newfoundland uh, in Labrador, Mr. Speaker, it was this premier who put it back on the national agenda. Now, having said that, the member is correct. Uh, uh, the Standing Committee uh, on Justice uh, tabled a unanimous report. Uh, uh, in this legislature, and of course, we are going to be taking action on that those parts of the report that uh, uh, that are under provincial uh, responsibility, Mr. Speaker. But just yesterday, we also had a motion in this house, which I thought was a very uh, f deliberately simple motion to call on the federal government to put repeat violent offenders in jail, to keep them in jail, Mr. Speaker, and to take action on that. It should have been a unanimous. Unanimously supported, Response. but it wasn't because the NDP, supported by the Liberals, tried to water down that emotion so that we could continue to evaluate programs. Mr. Speaker, we're done evaluating programs. We're taking action thanks to the leadership. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, look, uh, I too support federal legislation to strengthen uh, bail reform, but I also support the province taking action that's within its power. In late 2016, courthouses in two locations in the province started using judges to sit in bail courts instead of justices of the peace. This pilot project ended in 2019 after this government was elected. Judges have years of formal legal training and experience, and by all accounts, both from police associations and from defense associations, this, project, this pilot project was successful. Yet, the minister has yet to produce or at least publish a report into the pilot program. The chief of Toronto Police has called for judges to take over bail hearings for firearms offences and, I presume, other violent offences, Mr. Speaker. The Standing Committee on Justice Policy recommended expanding this pilot program to ensure that bail hearings for the most violent Question. crimes are heard by trained judges. This government has the power to do this today, Mr. Speaker. When will they use it to strengthen bail hearings here in Ontario? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad the Liberals have changed their mind and decided to support us on bail and asking the federal government to do that. I would, I would ask that the NDP change their mind and support us on bail as well, Madam, Mr. Speaker. But here, here's, here's the one thing they have in common, Mr. Speaker. They want us to interfere with how judges do their duty, Mr. Speaker. I heard it yesterday from the member in the NDP, and Order. today this member Order. wants me to interfere how judges do their business, Mr. Speaker. Order. I just can't understand. Well, I do understand why they're over there, Mr. Speaker. They don't understand the Order. fundamental divide of how we do justice in this province, Mr. Speaker. We need to Never do better. Us, we need to do more. We've already started. We ask you to join us. The next question. The member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Mines. Under the strong leadership of our government, this Premier and our Minister, our province now has a robust critical mineral strategy. This strategy is helping to build economic development opportunities with Indigenous partners through a range of programs that support skills training and business and economic development. For our government to be a world leader in critical mineral production, we must partner with local communities and recognize and respect their valuable contributions in order to achieve shared success. Speaker, can the minister please speak to the measures our government is undertaking to strengthen relationships with leaders in northern and indigenous communities regarding priority projects? Thank you. To reply, the Minister of Mines. Thank you for the question, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question from the honourable member uh, across from Brantford, Brant. I want to talk specifically about one project in one uh, First Nation, TTN. 
They're a company. I'm sorry. They're they're a First Nation that is just north of Timmins. They've partnered with uh, First Nickel, Canada Nickel, and it's a very interesting cobalt nickel project. The mineral that it's hosted with is serpentine. Serpentine absorbs CO2. The First Nation is the is the owner of the transmission line that will power that uh, that will uh, carry the power to that uh, project. They own that transmission line. Oh. The chief is Bruce Archibald. Mm -hmm. His sister is Roseanne Archibald, and I'm sure everybody knows who yes. Roseanne is. She told us last week, prior to this, prior to this uh, development, Response. before the uh, supporting development, the employment rate was 85 percent. Now it's below the national ad, uh, uh, average. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Time for the supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It is encouraging to hear about the progress that is underway in Northern and Indigenous communities as a result of constructive meetings with local leaders. While opposition members would rather criticize and complain, our government is working tirelessly to lay the foundation for agreements that benefit the North and all of Ontario. The mining industry in Ontario already generates more than $10 billion in annual mineral production and supports 75,000 direct and indirect jobs in our province. Our government must continue making the necessary investments in this rapidly developing industry to ensure that Northern and Indigenous communities are not left behind. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is making the most of the present opportunities to become a world Question. leader in responsibly sourced critical minerals. Thank you. Minister of Mines. Again, Mr. Speaker, for the question. Urgency is the key, and our government is acting accordingly to capitalize on this vast economic opportunity that will benefit generations of Canadians and Ontarians. We must act. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, thanks to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trades efforts, we are securing unprecedented investments on the other end of the supply chain. We are matching this, uh, those efforts through our proposed legislation, the Building More Mines Act, which, if passed, would save companies time and money. It will increase business certainty. It will promote investment in Ontario's mining sector so we can continue to be a responsible producer of critical minerals to power the global EV revolution. Here, here. President Biden, Biden just told the House of Commons he believes we have an incredible opportunity to work together so Canada and the United States can source and supply here in North America everything Response. we need for reliable and resilient supply chains. We encourage the members opposite to act with urgency and vote with us on this important piece of legislation. Yeah. The next question, the member for Meshkigawak, James Bay. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Many of our regions don't have access to broadband ser services. Some of those services have been interrup interrupted, and business with online business has had effect on children and their learning. There are problems in terms of retention for families in the north, and it is very difficult as representative to help others since they don't always have access to those services. My question is the following. The last report from the FAO has uh, concluded that only 1.6% of these allocations have been used. Are you going to propose alternatives, or will you finally respect your promises to those investments in the North? To reply, the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much to the member opposite. Uh, our government truly recognizes how important access to high-speed internet is, no matter where you live in the province of Ontario. I think we can all agree that COVID has certainly changed things and made it a necessity in terms of being able to educate your child, be able to contact your doctor, and or work from home, which is why our government is investing $4 billion to make sure that every single premise in the province of Ontario is connected by the end of 2025. And I would just remind the member opposite that this is the most ambitious high-speed internet broadband program in the country. Supplementary, the member for Nickel To the Premier again. In my writing, many people and businesses are relying on slow, unreliable, expensive internet. 
I have met with every internet provider. None of them is interested in setting up a nickel belt. There is no money to be made. You can pay for all the infrastructure. They're not coming. So we use phone line with a five megabyte download and two megabyte upload. How can business strive with this? The government claims that they'll spend millions, billions on broadband, but last year they spent less than 2% of that money. Will the government finally get that money out the door and put in place a government-run system for fast, reliable internet at reasonable price? Order. That will come to order the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We are not only investing $4 billion. Stop the clock. Okay. The member asked a question. The minister wants to reply. I need to be able to hear the minister's reply. I ask the House to come to order. Please restart the clock. Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I will repeat an investment of $4 billion is a historic financial investment in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we have also taken the initiative to present legislation in this House to expedite the delivery of broadband high-speed internet projects across this province, Mr. Speaker, and we are consistently interacting with internet service providers that have participated be it in our application-based uh, programming, our partnership with the federal government, and our reverse auction to make sure that even the toughest, hardest-to-reach places are invested in, and we will get everyone connected. And the next question, the member for Newmarket Aurora. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question to the Minister of Francophone Affairs. With more than 620,000 francophones and 1.5 million francophiles, Ontario has the greatest, largest francophone community outside of Quebec in Canada. Improving access to French language services that are of quality in different sectors is very important. Last Friday, a new regulation regarding active offer of French was put in place through the modernization of the French Language Services Act. Could the minister tell the House how this new regulation will affect French language services in Ontario? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank my colleague for her question. As you know, our government is the first one to have modernized the French Language Services Act over the past 34 year, 35 years, and this shows that we are committed to improve quality French language services in Ontario for francophones. This act, the modernized act, led to the creation of a new regulation detailing nine concrete measures that organizations that have to follow this act have to put in place in order to have active offering of French language services. It includes salutations, such as, greetings such as hello, bonjour, and having French signage. This forces these organizations to offer, actively offer uh, French language services and not to have people ask for those uh, services. Supplementary. Thank you to the minister for her answer. It is encouraging to hear the way our government is improving access to quality services in French. With this initiative, we not only facilitate francophones' access to their first language, but we are also increasing the number of qualified workers who are francophones and francophone and bilingual. The francophone community in Ontario deserves an environment that enables them to flourish so that they can keep working to the province's prosperity. Mr. Speaker, could the minister tell us more regarding this new regulation? And who has to follow this new regulation? The minister? 
Mr. Speaker, active offer means that French language services have to be available at the first contact between the provider and the citizen. Those who are affected by this act will be also affected by this regulation, including all ministries as well as designated organizations and the legislature's institutions. I am very happy with the progress we've made and to continue doing this work that is essential for the Francophone community in Ontario. While Active Offer was mentioned in the Act for a year now, the new measures are clarifying the minimal criteria to make sure that we have we are able to put in place this principle that is very important. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. My constituent Matt's Christmas holidays were destroyed by one short sentence. You may have ALS. Ontario has medication to slow paralysis and extends Matt's ability to use his hands, to eat, and to hug his children, to use his legs to walk outside and dance with his soulmate Kathy, and a throat to swallow and to say, I love you. Albriotza could lengthen Matt's life by 10 months, but only 7% of ALS patients are eligible. The personal costs are enormous. ALS is the bankruptcy disease. Can you imagine, Speaker? Right now, Matt's only option is to put his family in debt to stay alive because for the other drug, Ontario's EAP deems him too far gone to provide medication. Will this government do the right thing? fund Albriotza and extend Matt's precious time with his family. Mr. Powell. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the member opposite raises a really important issue that we deal with uh, on, a, on a daily basis in the Ministry of Health. And as new uh, interventions, whether they are medications or treatments, become available, of course, the Ministry of Health and our government wants to provide those as quickly as possible to individuals in Ontario. And, you know, I have to say, I was really proud of the fact that as soon as Trikafta was available for children and youth suffering with CF, uh, it was actually the Ontario government was, that was the first to list it. We, uh, we've, we've done the same, same thing very uh, recently with Luxerna, you know, a rare uh, inherited vision loss, and we now have that on the drug formula. We continue to work with the PCPA as they negotiate drug prices, Response. and we put those on the formulary as soon as we can because we know what kind of life-saving intervention these mean for the people of Ontario. Thank you. Of order, the member for London West. Thank you very much, Speaker. I'd like to recognize my two very hardworking staff who are here today from London West, uh, Janan Dean and Leah Carton. Uh, welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. I beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 9G, the clerk has received written notice from the government House Leader indicating that a temporary change in the weekly meeting schedule of the House is required. And therefore, the afternoon routine on Wednesday, Feb April the 5th, 2023, shall commence at 1 p.m. I also beg to inform the House that the adjournment debate, standing in the name of the member for Ottawa South, scheduled for today, has been withdrawn. Consequently, the adjournment debate will not be held today. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m. <laughs>